program like this together, one of the things is that you have a vision in your mind and then you wonder if it's all going to come together. And I have to say that one of the things for me so far is that everything is building on the next topic. And so that was what I envisioned and I'm really excited that this is happening. Um, so you may be wondering for this next session with uh, our economist Graham Slater and then Tom Russell, who's the CEO of Adventist Health, why, is the, why are they paired that way? I'm sure that question has been asked. Um, and actually, it was my brainchild, and I, I actually brainstormed a little bit with um, Janet Young of the economic development team in the city of Gresham. Because we were talking about the workforce development issues and, and the issues in the economy. And I had the privilege of hearing Graham speak actually at a Work Systems Inc. board meeting where he did a presentation on what's happening in the economy and where it's going and what the recovery looks like, as well as what's happening in the industry sectors um, that are growing, um, albeit slowly. And healthcare is one of those sectors that is growing um, more than any other sector. And so when I was talking about this with Janet, we thought, wouldn't it be interesting to have kind of the economic background and then from there look at, in the growing sector, what are uh, leading um, health care providers doing to maintain their workforce and to make investments in their workforce through training and leadership development. And that's why this session is grouped. And so with that, I'm very pleased to have both Graham Slater, come on up, Graham, and Tom Russell with us. And um, Graham has spent 29 years with the Oregon Employment Department, um, and for the last 13 years, he's been administrator of the division, um, of that division. And he's actually had a lot of awards that have come his way for his work. So I'm just going to keep these short this time, because everyone seems to cringe about the, the bios. And um, Tom is president and CEO of Adventist Medical Center, and he oversees a very high-performing network of Adventist Health um, Services. Um, he actually oversees two 2,000 employees and 500 physicians um, from facilities located between um, Hillsborough and to Welsh's from Vancouver uh, to Oregon City, so quite a broad reach. And um, Adventist has also um, received uh, several awards, the uh, Hospital Association's Grassroots Champion Award, and he's also currently on the Health Policy Committee for the Oregon Association of Hospitals and the Health Systems. Um, and a board member of HealthShare Oregon. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you gentlemen and thank you for being with us today. Hey, thank you very much, good morning. So it's a pleasure to be here. I was here about five, six years ago. Anybody remember me? <laughs> okay, one person, memorable event. Thank you very much, yeah. One of our employees remembers me. So the governor actually mentioned um, about a year ago the Oregon Workforce Investment Board, which is sort of a policy guiding group. There's regional boards, there's one here in Clackamas County. They were starting on a strategic planning initiative and um, we felt it was really important as the people who do the employment statistics for Oregon here in the employment department, you know, a lot of those things the governor talked about, the unemployment rate, wages, maybe not keeping up the way we'd like, different industries growing, but then some growing not so fast. Pretty much all of that stuff comes from our department, and we've got a group of staff who spend you know, 40 or plus hours a week stewing on those things, thinking about the data, what does it all mean? So we wanted to come up with some key issues, challenges, whatever your trends, whatever you want to call them, that the workforce board should be thinking about as they develop these strategic plans. Maybe the governor and his staff would be thinking about as they looked at that 10-year plan. And those, those challenges are on the screens. I know some of you standing right in front of me you're gonna to have to really try to look, but it's okay. Um, I will sort of talk about each of these eight challenges as we go. I'll go very fast and try to give you some um, interesting side notes. It's not all gonna be about statistics and graphs, but we think, we think these eight challenges are really, really significant in Oregon, and I'm gonna tell you why. The first one, unemployment. Unemployment's always a big deal. Unemployment's a big deal if the unemployment rate's 5%. It's a big deal if you're one of the unemployed or if one of your family members is. But when the unemployment rate goes up to 11, 12%, and as the governor said, it has come down measurably. It's now in the 8% range. But that's still a lot of Oregonians unemployed, far more than any of us would like to see. And there's sort of a one part B here, which is that a lot of the unemployed have been unemployed for a very long time. And I think actually that's almost a completely separate issue. How many of you know someone who's been unemployed for at least a year and they're still unemployed? Okay, there's a few hands going up. Yep, you know people like that. And, and that's pretty different than people who have been unemployed for two months 
and they've got some great job leads and they're going back to work. So we'll look at a couple of these things. Here, here's a graph that just shows the number of unemployed in Oregon. And, and I will show you a lot of graphs. And what I love to, to say to people, don't worry about the details. You know, if you try to understand every line and every number on a graph, I think you're missing the point. What's the big trend? What's the takeaway message? And the takeaway message on this one is that at the beginning of this recession, unemployment climbed incredibly fast. We were losing 10, 15, 18,000 jobs every month in Oregon, which for a state our size is just incredible, unprecedented, that pace of layoffs, you know, entire companies closing down. And you can see that the number of unemployed has drifted downwards in the last year or so, which is great. But is it really great? Are they all finding jobs? Or are they leaving or giving up or retiring earlier than they wanted with a whole lot less money than they wanted? So whenever you see things like the number unemployed, the unemployment rate, it's a whole lot more complicated than the one number that might be the headline in the newspaper. So the number of unemployed is down a little bit. The un number of unemployed in the Portland area is down a little bit. That's overall, I guess, good news. What we need to be thinking about is what are some of the reasons and particularly in this next one, what is going on with those people who have been unemployed a really long time? And the top shading in this graph shows people who have been unemployed for more than six months. And you can see, if you go back to the beginning of the recession, the good times was a very small number who had been unemployed for that short a period, I mean, that long a period. You fast forward in the last two or three years, and it's 40% of all the unemployed and I don't know how many of you would be able to read the table from where you're sitting, but I'm going to highlight some numbers for you. In 2007, on average, there were 39,000 Oregonians who had been unemployed for less than five weeks. Okay, 39,000. In 2011, so we've had a horrible recession, growth has been slow, there were about 39,000 Oregonians unemployed for less than five weeks. So you're thinking, okay, in this economy, as we're starting to climb out, the people who are newly unemployed, most of them are actually finding jobs and going back to work. Now look at the numbers for the people unemployed for more than a year. 20, 2007, 5,000. Last year, 57,000. Yeah, 10 to 1. So there's 10 times more people in Oregon right now who have been out of work and they're still looking for work. They haven't given up. They haven't moved somewhere else. They're still turning in applications, looking online, looking for jobs. There's 10 times more of them now than there were just four or five years ago. Now, people like Andrew, who will lead the next panel or the one after that, they're dealing with this every day on the front lines, helping those people with jobs, with job preparation, with training. But that's a huge challenge for our state. I'm going to move on because obviously we have limited time. Number two, structural changes. Whenever we say structural change in Oregon, what do people think of? What, what comes to your mind? Structural economic change? Wow, silent group. <coughs> Timber, thank you. And, and you know, looking at, this is actually a pretty mixed age group. A lot of the audiences I speak to, everybody's in their 50s, which is another of our challenges, right? But if you've been in Oregon in the workforce for quite a few years, when anybody says structural change, you think about wood products because we know what happened from the late 70s to the 80s and then on through really to the present time. But structural change um, can be a couple different things. Let's look here. Um, here's the losses in, in the uh, recession. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean any of these are structural. Manufacturing down 20-some percent in this recession. Construction down 35 percent in this recession. You know, if you go back to your company after this lunch, or this, this, this morning, and your boss greets you and says, we're taking a 35% cut in our company, that would be shocking news. But in construction, that was the entire industry took a 35% cut and not showing many signs of coming back. That would be a cyclical change if we all thought, oh, when the recovery comes, all those construction jobs are coming back. But we don't think that. And let me show you why. Here's the construction industry's employment. Again, takeaway message. Don't worry about the details huge, ridiculous high levels of, of construction employment. Everybody said they were unsustainable, but most people, in fact, maybe no one, realized how unsustainable they would be to where we are now. And I always say to people in graphs like this, don't just look at how far down it's come, look at how much we're starting to turn the corner and gain back. And the answer is not much. So yes, construction is no longer losing jobs every month, but it certainly isn't bouncing back. Manufacturing? There's a roller coaster. 
The good news for Oregon is that when manufacturing goes down in recessions, it usually comes back up at least part way. In some states, it's just a downward slope. It never does come back up at all. So Oregon is, is actually doing really well in manufacturing compared with most places in the nation. But again, how far back up has it come so far? Not so far. Here's another structural change, if I can connect here. Healthcare. Hmm. Maybe that's why Tom is the next speaker. Right? And that's an interesting one because we always think of structural change as being negative. We almost never talk about structural change as actually being positive. Healthcare makes up a much, much bigger portion of the economy and of the jobs than it did 20 years ago, and it's brought some really great jobs to Oregon. So that's a structural change, but one that's a little more positive. Number three, we are growing painfully, painfully slowly. Now, this graph, you do have to look at the details. You've got to look at every single line, OK? Now, this is one of my favorite graphs. And when I show it in audiences, they always cringe. All you need to know here is that every line on this graph represents employment loss and recovery in a recession since World War II. So you look at all the bunch of them, and usually employment goes down maybe you know, 3 6%. And it's gone back up within a couple years. That's what recessions used to be. We'd all, if that was true this time, we'd all be just saying unemployment's back at 6%. But we know that's not true. The, the bright blue one that goes way down and takes a long way back up, that was the early 80s. If you were working in Oregon in the early 80s, you know that was a brutal recession. Nationally, it was really two separate recessions. And when people put data together for Oregon, they just sort of say, forget that. It was just one long recession here. That's why it looks that way. Now, you look at the red line, that's this recession. So in some ways, not as bad as the early 80s. You younger folks who didn't know about the early 80s, think about if we lost 50% more jobs now than we already did. That's what the early 80s was like. It was really, really tough. But look at the pace of growth. And actually, it's going to take us just as long, if not longer, to bounce back this time, even though we didn't lose as many jobs as it did in the early 80s. The employment growth trend right now has been painfully slow over the last couple of years. And here's what it looks like. This absolute falling off a cliff, again, 15, 18,000 jobs a month, job losses. We turn the corner, and you know everybody hopes it's just going to bounce right back up. And what happens in, in reality is we've been adding very slowly over the last few years. Somebody's getting some. Oh, somebody's cell phone's ringing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so when I, when I give, you know, speak to audiences, I often say, imagine this was one of your investments. You lost $150,000 at the beginning of the recession, and you've gained back 50000 Are you cheerful about that? Well, it's better than losing another 50000 But really, that's what's happening with jobs. We lost 150000 really in maybe a year. And in three years or so, we've just gained back 50,000. That's one of the reasons why there's so many long-term unemployed and why the unemployment rate is still in the 8% range. We simply are adding jobs so, so slowly, as is the nation. Portland area, just sort of throwing one in for you guys, Portland area is doing a little better than that. Just over half the jobs seem to have come back. Not necessarily the same jobs, but at least the jobs count is coming back. Number four, this is one that, that Tom may touch on, and the panel certainly will. How in the world can it be in this kind of economy? Let me go to this next slide. Um, back in October of each year, we, we do a vacancy survey at the Employment Department. We're doing one right now. But last year's numbers, and I, I'll bet it hasn't changed too much, last year's numbers, we found out that all across Oregon, there were 30,000 job vacancies. All industries, big businesses, small businesses, healthcare, manufacturing, the whole thing, 30,000. At that time, and still today, there's 170,000 unemployed. How in the world can businesses be struggling to find workers? There's loads of workers out there, and many of them were working four years ago when this recession started. So they, they had some skills four years ago. What's changed now that suddenly we can't find them? Well, I've given this speech maybe 40 or 50 times in the last 10 years to all kinds of audiences, I mean, tailoring it to the audience, and had wonderful conversations. So I've learned a lot just from listening to what people say and we've come to the conclusion that there's three industries where you really can understand that maybe there are true shortages of the workers with the right skills for what the company needs. Manufacturing, I think is, it's ironic, but it may be one of them. And the panel later will probably address that. Can we find everything from CEOs and finance officers to CNC and welding and assembly all the way through manufacturing, can we find the workers we need? 
And I've heard over and over again that the answer is no. Part of it is that young people have been told over and over again, manufacturing, psh, declining, don't do that. And I was sitting next to a gentleman here at breakfast who's in the finance part of manufacturing, and I was sharing with him. I hear, as I give speeches, that really you know, bright finance graduates, accounting graduates, HR graduates, if they're given a choice, you know, which industries am I going to go into with my great skills, many of them don't choose manufacturing. They might choose healthcare because they've grown up understanding that healthcare is growing, manufacturing not so much. So that will be a real challenge for us. And then it goes all the way through all those different occupations. Healthcare, why would it have shortages? Well, you saw the graph. Healthcare laid off very few people in it as an industry during the recession. So if we need 5,000, I'm making up numbers now, if we need 5,000 new nurses next year, there's not a lot of nurses unemployed laid off. We need to be constantly training, and it's hard to find them. If you're talking about construction workers, you need 5,000 construction workers next year? We just laid off 35,000. You know, you need a plumber? There's lots of plumbers. You need an electrician? There's lots of electricians. The governor mentioned, as, as you sort of kind of go out into the future, will there be shortages because of older workers, construction, manufacturing? There might be in the future, but this recession has kind of reset that discussion because there's a whole lot of unemployed but skilled people sitting there wishing the phone would ring with a job. Now, the other one is truck driving, which I won't spend a lot of time on, but I've been doing this almost 30 years. I think truck drivers has been on the shortage list. We can't find them pretty much my whole career. And part of that has to do with good old working conditions. You know, there's a lot of guys, particularly, laid off in construction, manufacturing. Oh, I could be a truck driver. It's kind of macho and, you know, hit the road. And they go to school and they get their, their licenses, and they do that, especially the long haul. They do it for a while. And they realize it's goodbye to family life, it's goodbye to any sense of normalcy, and actually the wages and income from that are nowhere near what they used to be. Because wages are down, gas prices are up, rules are much more strict, you can't drive as many hours as you used to, so it takes you a lot longer to accomplish the task of delivering. So that one is a real problem for us. Okay, number five, connecting training to workforce needs. We hear a couple things on this one in, 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 in a longer presentation. I love to ask the question, and I see I can't resist it even now. How many of you have history degrees? Quick hands up. Yep, there's always one, <laughs> two. OK, you can admit it. It's OK. Because I think it's really important to make this point that one of the great myths, and I don't have a slide for it because I was trying to be quick here, one of the great myths is that we've got all these people trained in things like history. My daughter is doing medieval English. You know, OK, yeah, thank you for laughing. Um, we've got all these people doing all these things. And of course, well, of course they're not going to find a job. I mean, there's no jobs for people of that. And I've got a great slide that shows if you sort all of the graduates in Oregon of post-secondary training of all sorts, things like history and medieval English, they're way down the bottom. It doesn't mean they're not important, but it's kind of a mistake to say, well, that's the issue. Because at the top are things like accounting and engineering and business and education and construction trades all things that are very workforce related. Another thing we hear, and it may be one of your questions earlier may have addressed this, another thing we hear is that even as, as, as schools and colleges are training people for certain things, they don't have the money to buy the equipment that businesses are really using today. So they're training on what this used to be done like 10 or 15 or 20 or more years ago. The business is saying, I want somebody to show up on day one who knows this equipment, this technology, and is ready to go. And that may be sort of an impossible situation unless somebody really ponies up huge money to make that happen. So much longer discussion here. I, th I think the takeaway message here is you can have people with the right sort of level of education, post-secondary, bachelors. It doesn't mean they're exactly what you're looking for in your company, healthcare being a great example. You can have all the engineers you want, but it doesn't fill nursing openings. But you know, that's an obvious one. You can filter that all the way through the workforce. Um, we know that businesses sometimes struggle with the technical needs. But we know over and over again from direct surveys that the soft skills, the some people call them basic workplace skills, are super important. We've, we've interviewed economists with PhDs, master's degrees. Did they know the economics? Totally. Did we want them as part of our team? Absolutely not. Right? You've had experiences like that, whether it's welders or teachers or whatever, whatever it is you hire, people who have that communication team showing up on time, and yes, sometimes, in soft skills, people throw in passing the drug test. Like that's a skill, right? <laughs> but uh, but I, I've, I've had people say that. Um, cl classic story from about 20 years ago, and I'll, I'll move on then. 
Uh, one of our managers, McMinnville, office manager, long retired, he had someone looking at, an unemployed person look at him, and he said, it was truck driving actually, he said, so can you pass the drug test? And without flinching, the guy, guy looked back and said, when are they going to do it? <laughs> so, moving on, moving on. Younger workers, how am I doing for time here? I better search. How are we doing? Oh, I'm good. I've got 10 minutes. Younger workers, this, I'm passionate about this because I have three kids in their 20s, so they're young workers. Picture yourself, some of you, you, or some of you, your children, or nieces or nephews. You graduated with an accounting degree, right, because I want to make it very business relevant, in the summer of 2008. You think, this is great. I mean, I've got this degree. I could go in public sector, private sector, nonprofit, any kind of industry. They all need good finance people. And towards the end of 2008, things are starting to slow down, and half of your graduating class doesn't get jobs in accounting. And you or your daughter, let's say, is one of them. So they might find some other part-time job, not in accounting, and they think, well, you know, we'll, we'll get through this sort of slowish period by next summer when the big hiring surge happens. I'm sure I'll find a job. Well, between the summer of 2008 and the summer of 2009, you saw the graphs, things absolutely collapsed. So then they're still not working in accounting. You move forward to the summer of 2010, surely things will pick up. We added pretty much no new jobs in that whole 12 months. Summer of 2011, pretty much no new jobs. Now, I'm oversimplifying. But you get to the summer of 12, and as the governor said, we've added about 25,000 jobs in the last 12 months. From our, from our statistics, that would be a pretty typical, average, decent year of employment growth in Oregon, except we're 150,000 in the hole. So it doesn't feel very decent. If we were sort of at the average, that would be OK. So that graduate from 2008 with an accounting degree is now still looking for a job, maybe, and competing, again, oversimplifying, competing with four and a half years worth of graduates in accounting, because none of them found jobs either. Oh, and by the way, some pretty major companies laid off accountants, so they're in the mix too. And some accountants that thought they were going to retire by now couldn't, because you know, the investments didn't go so well. So all I'm pointing out is this has been a really, really tough period for many of our young people who actually did everything we all told them. Graduate from high school, do post-secondary, get a bachelor's, get an associate's. And we, I'm sure Andrew's heard this. We've had people in our offices say to us, I did everything you told me, all you sort of clever policymaker types. I did it all. I'm still unemployed. And by the way, those young people have, some of them, a lot of debt, not from buying houses and cars, but from student loans. So they're carrying all that. And do we care? Well, we care if it's our son or daughter. But we should care more broadly, because those people are not buying cars. They're not paying rent. They're not saving for a house. They're not doing a lot of things that would put money in your pockets, in your companies, so it drags down the whole economy. Here's one of my favorite slides that always gets a laugh. 19% of young males up to the age of 34 are living at home with their, I mean, with their parents at home. And I have two boys in that age group, and I love them, and they love me, and we have great times together. They do not live in my house. <laughs> they don't want to live in my house. I don't want them living in my house. <laughs> but for a lot of people, you know, I can joke about it, because fortunately, they both do have jobs. But a lot of people, that's the reality. It's impossible for them to move out of the house right now. Um, someone asked me once, well, how come females are so much more independent? I didn't touch that, right? So <laughs> but it is an interesting statistic. OK, and teenagers, how many of you believe that you know, working as a teenager is good and character building and teaches you work skills? And some of you, oh, two people believe that? OK. I was going to say, usually more people believe that. And what I want to tell you is that half as many teenagers in Oregon are working right now as was true a few years ago. And that's not because there's fewer teenagers. It's because there's fewer opportunities, fewer jobs, partly because there's simply fewer jobs and partly because when you go to places, restaurants, Starbucks, gas stations, grocery stores, when you go to places where you used to see a lot of teenagers, who do you see now? 40, 50, 60 year olds working. That dynamic has completely changed in the last few years. And so a lot of teenagers cannot find jobs. So it's really impacting them. Aging workforce. I probably mentioned this when I was you five years ago or so. Um, because at the time, every speech I gave, everybody wanted to know about the baby boom crisis. And the concept was all of us baby boomers, 1946 to 1964. I always used to say, you know, we're all going to wake up on the same day, November 2017. We're going to roll over in bed, grab our cell phone, call our boss, and say, you know what? 
I sort of was thinking about this overnight. I'm done. I'm retired. I'm not coming to work. And if all the baby boomers do that on the same day, yes, we have a crisis, but you know that won't happen. They will retire over years because they have different finances and family and health and all kinds of situations. So for a lot of the state, we don't feel like it's as big a problem as people make out. In fact, if it was a huge problem, you would expect the bars on the right of this graph to be really big and the bars on the left to be pretty small, i.e. there's just no young people to fill all the jobs that these older people have. And for Oregon as a whole, the bars are pretty level. I don't think it's as big a deal as we would think. For Portland, look at Multnomah County, the orange color, there's a bunch of young people. You all know that. Portland State just released a, a, a report on that. You know that. But look at what happens. I gave a similar speech in Prineville recently. Look what happens in rural Oregon. Crook County. Is there a baby boom problem there? Kind of looks like it. When those middle-aged, older workers move on, there are not as many young, young people there, which takes me right to my last one, uh, which is that in general, not always, in general, anything that you all are suffering, concerned about here in Multnomah County and Gresham, you can pretty much you know, you know, multiply it by 20, 30, 100% if you lived in what I'll call truly rural Oregon, Burns, John Day, Baker City, maybe Coos Bay, some of those areas. Um, the unemployment rates, the top line is rural. The unemployment rates are essentially always higher in those rural areas if you take them as a group. The employment growth is the bottom line. It's always slower in the rural areas. And um, I was shocked in this last census to see the number of counties in Oregon where young people are actually leaving. I mean, not just one or two young people. We know that happens but the number of young people is lower now than it was 10 years ago. That has not been true very much over the years. And let me close with this one. It's kind of a depressing ending, but I, I'm, I've been in Oregon 30-some years. I love this state, and as the governor was saying, we all should care about the whole state, just not our sort of little part of it. Um, eight of our counties, first time ever, eight of our counties have fewer residents today than they had 10 years ago. That, that's a Nebraska, South Dakota kind of story not an Oregon kind of story. So that's a big shock. 14 of the counties have fewer young people. You know, the governor was laughing about Grants Pass and saying, you know, what do you do when an economic developer comes to town? And they say, oh, yeah, I remember seeing a photo of your community with people running out of the jail. Well, what do you do when the economic developer comes to town and says, I've been looking at census data. It looks like your young people are leaving. What kind of vibrant community do you have? Now, it's not quite that bad yet, but it's starting. And then my final one, in six counties, the median age is 50 or older. Median age, oldest person sorted to youngest person. Median's right in the middle. That really changes some dynamics if the median age is over 50. How are you going to vote on school ballot measures, school budget measures, if you're not only are you long ago from your school or your children's school, but in Oregon, a lot of those folks came from somewhere else. They don't have grandchildren in that school district. And that's just one example of how that older group really can make a difference. So thank you very much. I'll hand it over to Tom's presentation. And we'll stay up here. Thanks. So as we look at health care, we have the aging process that Graham is talking about. But in addition to that, in healthcare, we have the aging process that's also going to be driving the demand for that service up. So we've got to be looking at ways that we will both educate and retain the people that we have in the organization. So what I'm going to be talking about is how we invest in our people. And you might go away from here saying, well, I'm not a hospital. I can't do the stuff that we're talking about. Well, why don't you look for are the principles that we talk about today. Take those principles back because I believe they apply in every industry. Um, we always start our work with uh, this model. It starts with mission. Everything that we do starts with mission. That purpose drives the development of our culture, and that is how we do what we do in our organization. That goes from there to training our people in that culture, which drives the excellence of both quality and service, which drives growth for us, that allows us to touch more people with mission. So for us, what is the mission about? Our mission is simply to demonstrate the human expression of the healing ministry of Jesus. And many people can look at that and say, so that's about healing. But I would, cause, I would encourage you to look at it again. It's about healing and ministry wrapped in the compassion of Jesus Christ. You see, it calls us to excellence in clinical care, which is what you think about in healthcare, 
It also calls us to excellence in human relations, and that's critically important because as we can decrease anxiety, help people feel more comfortable in whatever setting they're in, healing improves. And that's what we're about in healthcare is making sure that that happens. The values talk about the way we go about doing what we do um, in the healthcare industry. So how do we make that happen in our organization? In our organization, we call it faithful service. It's about creating a great place for people to work, physicians, staff, volunteers, a great place for physicians to practice medicine, and a great place for patients to receive care, always focused on the patient. But we think it starts with the people uh, that make that happen. Gary Keller puts it this way. He says, your business plan is what you are, but your culture is who you are. So I think we've got to look at who we are as organizations and how we interface with our community. That culture is responsibility of everybody. We all wear different titles in our organizations, and we often think that those titles come with different tasks. In fact, when we ask our new employees what service they provide to the patient, they often list all the tasks that they have in the organization, and they believe that that's the service that they provide. But I want to talk more about that in a minute. So what are people want to be involved in? Purpose. They want to know why I'm here today. Not what I'm supposed to be doing, those tasks, but why is it that I'm here? What's the purpose for me being here? And I would argue that our purpose is for creating positive, memorable experiences for people, and that's going to be critical in healthcare. We'll look at that in a little bit. Worthwhile work. People want to be involved in doing something worthwhile that's bigger, higher, better than just who they are as individuals. In other words, calling to a higher purpose. Making a difference. Is what I'm doing today making a difference in the lives of others? Is there an outward focus there that says there's more than just me in this equation? So at the end of the day, our role as leaders is to try to connect the dots, is what I call it, between the things that I do or the things that our people do in that greater purpose that we have going forward. So I think we've got to change our thinking, and this is really where the core of that begins. Change our thinking from the task, those things that we do every day, to purpose. In healthcare, those things that we do every day are we admit patients, either to clinics or hospitals or home care, whatever it is. We have physicians writing orders, um, organizing care plans. We give medications. We do treatments. A long list of things that our employees will tell us they do for tasks. But I want you to think differently about what it really means. If we could design a job description that fit everybody in the organization, what would that look like? I think it calls us back to purpose, and I think it calls us back to creating that positive, memorable experience. Um, I think we learn by stories. I was, with, I was in my office one morning about 10 o'clock. The phone rang. It was my wife, Kim, on the phone. She said, I'm going to be in the vicinity of the hospital today about lunchtime. Can you have lunch with me today? I can count on one hand the chances that I get to do that in a year during the week. And so I looked at my schedule, and that day from 12 to 12.30, I had 30 minutes available, so I thought, I do. Um, I'll see you for lunch. She shows up to my office just before 12. We go downstairs to the cafeteria. We're selecting our food. I'm getting ready to pay for the food. And as I look in the cafeteria, I see a friend that we know, a um, guy that works in telecom. I turn to Kim, and I say, you mind if we sit with Mike? She looks at me, and she said, it's up to you. <laughs> See, I'm not as smart as all of you. I missed that cue. <laughs> so I sat with Mike a few minutes later. <laughs> and, and my wife. A few minutes later, another guy from IT joined us. We all had lunch together for 30 minutes. And then I got up, put my tray on the conveyor belt, went back upstairs thinking, it was really nice to have lunch with Kim that day. I went home that night. <laughs> we were having lunch or dinner together, just the two of us, and I was, I was sitting there thinking to myself, it was really nice to have seen her today. So I turned to her, and I said, it was really nice to have lunch with you today. And what did she tell me? <laughs> you didn't have lunch with me today. You had lunch with the guys, word for word, what she said. <laughs> so I would ask you, what was the task at hand for lunch? So she's saying eat, you're saying relationship, I'm going to go with eat. 
you see, see that, yeah, see, he's, he's getting it. See, the task was going downstairs, selecting the food, buying the food, sitting down, consuming the food, and getting up, tray on the conveyor belt, back upstairs, that's the task, right? Synonymous with all those things we do in our organizations that are orders and medications and all that stuff in healthcare, and I was talking to you in Boeing, your set of tasks is a completely different set of tasks than we do. And so as you think about the tasks that you do in your organization, it's our job to connect those tasks to some kind of a higher purpose and change the thinking from task to purpose. And why is that important? It's important because if we can do that, we then don't have to rely so much on the left side of the screen and we start working on the right side of the screen, which is where quality happens. We wrestled for years with ventilator-associated pneumonias. It used to be thought that if you're on a ventilator, just a certain percentage of patients are going to get a pneumonia. That's just the way it is. Is that right, Gretchen? That's I appreciate the leadership that Gretchen provides uh, in the community for health care, and I worked with her for a number of years. Um, but the thinking on that has changed today, and even with the best bundles of care that IHI, International or Institute for Healthcare Improvement, they have a whole series of things that you need to do to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonias. We were doing all those things, but we were still getting a ventilator-associated pneumonia now and then. Until one day, an employee working on the right side of that screen asked the question, why is it that patients have to get pneumonia with this process? What's going on? What can we do different? And she noticed that the pillows that we use to prop patients up could be anywhere. It could be behind you. It could be at your feet. It might fall on the floor. Sometimes it might be under your head. And so she said, what if we would make sure that the pillow under their head is only under their head? and nowhere else. So we developed a blue pillowcase. That blue pillowcase is the only end of the head. The ventilator-associated pneumonias went away, and we're going on 40, how many? About 46 months, something like that, with no ventilator-associated pneumonias. You see, that doesn't happen unless people are engaged in making a difference. That training and education moving to quality and excellence. Policy and passion. We have policies for everything in healthcare. Whatever happens, we've got a policy for that. I think manufacturing, you've got a lot of policies to drive that as well. But it takes people understanding purpose to get the outcomes that we want. And so if we want to produce a positive, memorable experience, we have to have people thinking about that as a serve patients. We had a patient come into the hospital one time. He was an over-the-road over, over trucker, happened to be in Portland, had an acute incident, was brought to the hospital, he was admitted, and he was very agitated, very nervous, very upset, and nobody could figure out what was going on until Jeff, one of our respiratory therapists, was talking to him in the room, trying to break through that piece of anxiety, and he found out that he had travels with a dog, and the dog was in the hotel. It was very hot. It was July or August. It was extremely hot, and he was concerned about that dog being in that hot motel without air conditioning, and he was worried about his truck over at the motel. Where is, you know, how am I going to get my truck? Jeff happened to be a past trucker. So he took it upon himself to go get the dog from the hotel. It was over 100 degrees in the room. Gets the dog, gets the truck, brings it back to the campus, and assures him that that's OK. He calmed down. He got better. And we created a positive, memorable experience because we had one employee who was willing to break a number of what I would suggest would be policies that would suggest he shouldn't do that. <laughs> you know, liability and all that stuff that you worry about. But he did the right thing, and we want to cheer Jeff on for what he did because he created that positive, memorable experience for that patient. Directing to coaching. Rather than giving directions, coach our people on purpose to help them understand how what they do matters at a high level in the organization. From control to freedom, that fits as well. So those are some key things that we look at. So how do we do that? Um, we invest in our employees through a number of these things that you see on the screen. I'll go through each of those individually. Um, the first one, leadership development. We have a quarterly, two-day leadership development institute. We take all of our leaders. If somebody reports to you, you're required to come with us for two days each quarter to learn about the things that you see on the screen. Um, communication skills. How do we raise delicate issues and make sure that that happens effectively, that we get achieve achievement there? If somebody confronts you, somebody like physicians, angry patients, whoever it is, 
Are you able to deal with those effectively and turn that around and make it a positive, memorable experience, reduce anxiety, and improve healing in the organization? Resilience training. We do really well with the, with the um, attitudes of, of teamwork and safety in the organization. In fact, some of our scores are some of the best in the industry uh, in Adventist health. But one thing that we didn't do very well was resiliency. We burn out because we're focused on those things. And so we do resilience, resiliency training with our staff to make sure that they have the fire in their belly, if you will, to be able to meet those needs, emotional and spiritual, that the patients have. Evidence-based leadership, we teach that to say what you do as a leader in this organization makes a difference at a high level for patient care. So somebody could look at me and say, Tom, you're an administrative leader. What in the world can you do to make a difference in quality? Let me give you an example. Why do you want to keep turnover rates low in organizations? What? Cost? That's the typical answer. Let me tell you why you want to keep turnover rates low in healthcare. Studies show us that if leaders can keep turnover rates below 12%, their lengths of stay for hospital care are significantly lower, and their mortality rates are significantly lower. Why do you suppose that is? People know what they're doing, and they trust each other. They communicate with each other, and so with fewer words, they can communicate very quickly transfer information or transfer knowledge in the organization and provide better care for patients if our turnover rate is lower. So the cost stuff is all a side benefit for the community. And by the way, when we think about the value of stewardship was one of the values that was on the screen. For us, the value of stewardship is about what are we doing to conserve the health care dollars for the community. See, the stewardship isn't about our money. The stewardship is about the money for the community to say, are we doing things in our organization, driving quality up, reducing infections, the average infection in costs, average hospital acquired infection, will cost somewhere between the neighborhood of $15,000 if the patient dies or $40,000 if they live. So infections are serious business in healthcare because we want people to live and we want costs to be lower. So by the time you drive quality up, costs are going to go down. We want to make sure that that continues going forward. So that's the stuff we teach in these institutes. Um, another program, Versant, uh, RN Registry, uh, Residency Program, this is taking what I will call baby nurses, if you will, just out of school, have a lot of knowledge. We need to teach them to use that in the work setting and in the culture, if you will, to make a difference in the lives of patients. And so we take them right out of... Um, uh, graduation, run them through an intensive program, and once they're finished with that program, um, which is a matter of, of, of a few months, they actually have about 18 months of experience under their belt, if you will, because it's an intensive program of leadership that we go through. So that one makes a difference for our staff as well and for our patients. Another thing we do is the all-staff assembly. Um, we get all of our um, employees together, uh, have a number of programs over a very short period of time so that we can expose them to a number of things. One is recognition for the work that they're doing to make a difference in the, in the, in the community. Uh, secondly, education on something that we need them, the entire organization, to understand and do the same throughout what we do. Um, and the last one is commitment to purpose, calling them back to why it is that we come to work every day. Um, and you see the left picture there? That's the executive team trying to do a Huey Lewis band kind of thing. Um, <laughs> And this guy right here is responsible for getting us up there and doing that stuff. Um, but uh, those are the kind of things that make leaders real in the organization. If you're willing to be vulnerable, make a difference with people, um, it can be fun and it can bring people together. So the concept of changing our thinking is critical. There's another place we need to change our thinking, not just in our organizations but in our communities. And that's how we think about health and wellness in, this, uh, in our society. Um, here's one thing that we're doing to try to make a difference in that. We have what's called a Living Well program. Part of that Living Well program is what we call Engaged. And the Engaged product is a product that we have within our health plan that is about encouraging people to change the things that they do with their body to be healthy. Um, and if they do that, they can go down the left side of that graph, which says, I choose to be engaged in the product, which means I sign up, number one. I fill out a health risk assessment, which tells them and us about the risks that they have in their life so that we can begin to think about how we manage those going forward. They also participate in what we call living and doing or, or learning and doing. 
and they get points for those. And if you get a certain number of points, then you get a discount on your um, insurance premiums. And those learning points have specific things that you can do videos, you can go to programs, you can go to classes, you can read books, a lot of things that help us understand more about what really drives health in this country and health in their lives. And then there's this doing thing. So what are you doing with your body? Are you good with remote control? Or are you good at running or biking or hiking or doing those kind of things that makes a difference in your life? And so we encourage people in that engaged product on the left side of the screen to do that. They get better benefits, if you will. And as long as they comply with that and work with the case manager, so for example, if someone's identified as having um, a chronic disease process going on, diabetes, for example, and there are certain things that we can do to help manage that effectively with diet and exercise as well as medication. And if they will participate with a health coach in that process, then they get to stay in that left track. If they choose not to participate with the health coach, they go to the right track. So we're doing things that really begin to drive change, and we're seeing that as we move into the second year of this now, we're seeing changes in all the biometric screenings that we have, in the, in the behaviors that they exhibit. It's making a difference. And why is that important in healthcare? You could again say, well, it's important for cost, right? That's part of the reason. But the reason that we do that is because it's around mission, to say if we're truly going to be able to have the emotional energy, if you will, to meet the emotional and spiritual needs of patients in our organization, then we need employees who feel good, who come to work every day, who are part of a cont continuous workforce that have the energy to meet those needs in the organization. So it's still about patients, about making a difference in the lives of patients. Could you advance the slide? I don't seem to be able to get it from here. I want to introduce, uh, introduce you to Mei Ling. Um, she's a housekeeper. She worked for 30 years in the OR. And you can see some of her tasks listed on the screen. And you could add a, a whole bunch of other things to her work to make sure that we have a clean environment to do surgery. And when she retired, her single greatest concern was I want to make sure that the person who follows me keeps a really clean environment because I'm concerned about making sure there's no infections. You see, Mei Ling understood that creating a positive, memorable experience for surgery patients, it means great service, and that means no infections. So when you have people engaged in that, Rather than just doing those tasks and not thinking about why I'm doing those, what you get is this. You probably saw a report on infection rates in the six surgical sites that were studied by the um, Office of Health Policy and Research in the state of Oregon, where in the six surgical sites study, there were no infections in our organization with any of those. And that's due not so much, I would say, to policy but more to the Mei Lings of the world who understand why they come to work every day. Being in the top 5% of hospitals in the nation for patient safety, we think is part of the thing that we can do to contribute to holding costs down in our organization, holding costs down in our community, and making a difference in the lives of patients. Because if you look at those numbers, if all the hospitals performed at that level, we could prevent a lot of deaths. And patients leaving the hospital alive, being able to go back to their homes, is a good thing. Yeah. So that's what we're about. And it's the people, the Mei Lings of the world, that help make that happen. So as leaders, I would encourage you to create the environment. You see, I can't provide patient care. I would be dangerous. But what I can do is help to create the environment by thinking those things that encourage our people, by doing those things that create the environment for our people, and by living those things that create the environment for our people to be able to flourish and do well in the work that they do. I was in the staff lounge, a physician lounge, having lunch with some physicians about a week ago. 
the one on my left was saying how good the food was. We only serve vegetarian food um, in our cafeteria uh, and to the physicians. And the one on my right said, yeah, the food is good. He says, uh, I'm a vegetarian now because I'm eating here. I says, well, what's the story on that? And he said, well, I eat three meals a day. Two of them I eat here at the hospital, breakfast and lunch. The fourth, the third one I eat at home, and I have meat and some other things there. And he said, I realized that the third one was not so good. So I just started eating vegetarian all the time, and we just recently opened uh, a plant-based bistro uh, in the pavilion, and he says, I've tried that food now, and I think there's probably no reason for me not to eat that way. And so by those thinking those things, doing those things, living those things that create the environment that drive where we need to go with healthcare in our country today, I think we make a difference at a high level simply by thinking, doing, and living those things that need to be done. So that leads to growth. Um, You've heard a number of people talk about and experience the um, changes that we saw in our economy. That affected all of us. And it flattened the health care um, volume, if you will. But throughout that, we've continued to see growth in the organization. And I believe that is related to those things that we're talking about, to provide excellent service, excellent care, meet those emotional and spiritual needs of the patients. Doing the right thing is the right thing for our community. So I want to thank you for letting us be here today. I think it's time for questions. We have these gentlemen up here who are great minds, so let's take advantage of it. We have a question on the far end of the room. I would sort of encourage that we focus on both, would be my personal thought. I, um, so for those of you that are, are you in the workforce system? Are you, you sound like you know a lot about this stuff, right? Um, so, so for those of you that, that aren't in the workforce system, very briefly, um, we, the employment department, and many other en entities like us around the nation, we do look at 10-year projections of employment. And that's, a, I mean, that's one of the reasons we can tell the colleges, we can tell the universities, Boy, you know, engineers is going to be a need, nursing is going to be a need, and so on. What I think you're getting at, and certainly in this economy, one of the challenges is, you know, who cares about 10 years from now? We've got 170,000 unemployed right now. Um, and yes, we, we can look at the, certainly the, the openings that are listed in the public labor exchange, i.e. you list your openings with the employment department. It's a skills-based system. So we can look at some of those and say, what skills are most in need? Um, I would say, though, you can only go so. I mean, I love statistics, right? It's what I do. You can only go so far. A and you know, Andrew certainly would know, and others. What we try to tell groups, workforce, colleges, whoever, to do is use our statistics, use our projections, use our data to sort of focus in in the right broad directions. And then we literally say, you have to talk to companies. You know, the classic example in the Douglas County, Roseburg area, we did a skills survey for them a number of years ago. Um, and one of the skills that manufacturers down there couldn't, couldn't find was welding. And the community college felt like, well, we have a welding program. And what's, what's the disconnect here? And, and we encouraged them, go talk to the businesses and, and really understand what kind of welding they want. What are the details? 
And it turned out they were making aluminum boats. I, I know nothing about welding, but they were making aluminum boats. That's pretty different than the sort of regular farm lumber, you know, lumber manufacturing welding that maybe was being trained for. So I don't want to get too long on my answer. Yes, there's data. Happy to sort of talk to you afterwards about that. But I think the data only takes you so far, and you know, policymakers, colleges, and so on, you've got to sit down with the relevant businesses in your area and really have a heart to heart and say, what specific skills do you need, especially when you're looking at the jobs right now? Who knows better than the business that's got the recruitment out? So. Well, we're, we're part of the, uh, I participate as a board member on the, the Health Share of Oregon um, organization that's really looking at how we take all the players, if you will, in the tri-county area that have all developed some very sophisticated systems and how do we integrate those to work together more um, efficiently. I think that's really the challenge is to say how do we drive uh, a medical model to help manage a population that has been previously unmanaged and do that in a way that manages those costs around the principles that we were talking about here, the health and wellness stuff. You know, the, the, uh, um, the engaged product that I was talking about, we're piloting that right now with an employer to say, can these same principles work? If they work for us and our workforce, can we implement those same principles with an employer and partner with them in doing that. And so we're in the process of making that happen right now. So that's one way that we can help with that. And we want to take what we learn from those in terms of how we, um, how we take the information that we have about the population and then profile that and predict, use a predictive modeling to say if we see these things going on with a, with a patient now, we can predict that given that, this is going to happen in the future that moves them into a very high cost category. We want to prevent that. So those are the things that we're playing with inside of our existing population and beginning to pilot that now with an employer. And we want to take those lessons, if you will, and use that in these populations so that we can cannot wait until, say, oh, they're in the hospital or in the ICU, now what do we do? But when they're in primary care and they're beginning to exhibit symptoms, either through behaviors or through clinical claims that are going on, exhibit those symptoms that will take them in that direction, we want to stop it right there. So um, we don't have answers to that yet, but there's a lot of people in this community working on that, uh, led by David Labby uh, there. Um, George Brown is heading up that organization as chair for us. So a ton of work going on there to make that happen. So we're having to find answers for that as we move forward. So thank you both gentlemen for a very stimulating conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.